Thanks. Sounds good? Sound is good. Okay. Can I, I just talk at a normal level? Just go like this if I'm, I mumble or something. So, um, so a couple things. So um, my talk slides for today's talk, I just uploaded them so they're available here if you want to see what's ahead and leave early. Um, <laughs> there's also, you're, you're more than welcome to, to, to tweet this. Uh, my Twitter handle is ctitusbrown. Um, basically that with the, without the period. And uh, um, if you have questions and stuff that you want to ask, that's a perfectly good way to, to reach me. Um, so so I, I started preparing this talk and I realized that um, I didn't like the last couple talks I gave on sort of similar subjects. And so uh, um, since this talk involved some sort of new techniques and observations that I hadn't talked about previously, uh, and this was also a data science audience as opposed to a biology or bioinformatics audience, I actually wrote a whole new talk and I gave it a, a whole new name. Um, and, and I should say that this is, this is going to be a little weird. So I just want to apologize up front for those of you who came here expecting to get like a t super hardcore bioinformatics and sequence analysis lecture. Because I'm going to talk about my alternate career as a uh, literature phenomenologist, which is to say um, looking at libraries and books being recovered from those libraries uh, and, and some of the methods and observations we're using for looking at, at these things. So um, there, there is a loose analogy, there's a not so loose analogy to, to metagenomics and, and uh, um, environmental sequencing and assembly, but, but you don't really need to understand anything at all about biology to listen to this talk. And uh, if you know a lot about biology, it may actually get in the way. So you've been, you've been warned. <laughs> um, I should also say, um, uh, before I continue, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And there's, there's a, a, many different reasons, but I want to highlight two. So one is that, um, well, three. I, I love the Pacific Northwest. I, uh, I went to college in Portland, and I, I always like coming back and and I'm from California, so rain is a, is a pleasant thing, um, unlike here where it's sort of more common, I gather. Uh, but I should say that the physics building, the institute right here, is something that my father was involved in, in the funding for. He was a physicist. So I was actually on this campus at some point in probably like 30 to 35 years ago, before the building existed, touring it with my father and, and checking things out. And so now it's nice to visit the building. The other thing is that uh, I got the... The, um, I was here at the, inaug at the opening of the data science, at, at, of the eScience Center, uh, just when you, you announced the grant and you had some sort of hors d'oeuvres party for, for everybody uh, somewhere. And for some reason, I was up here in Seattle. I don't know why. I think I was actually interviewing. I was, I was in one of my perennial escape attempts from academia, and I was interviewing at a company. And, and I heard, hey, there's free food on UW campus, and I knew where it was. <laughs> and so I thought, hey, you know, why don't I stop by and get some free food? Um, and I was at the, the reception when I got the phone call that said I was being invited for an interview at Davis, which is where I now, which is where I then moved. So I have very fond memories of, <laughs> of, of, of the situation. Anyway, so, um, so, okay. So what I want you to do is take a step away from your, your daily reality of whatever it is you work on and just imagine that you're in this really weird situation where you're, you're, you've been tasked with investigating this vast literature that's in a completely unknown language, a language that you, have, you basically only know the alphabet for. And this is a language that has evolved over millions of years, billions of years. There are billions of scholars involved in uh, writing this literature and, and forwarding these, these, these books through the generations. There's trillions of books, and there's millions of libraries containing all of these books. Um, and I should say that this is essentially the problem that our lab has been working on for the last 10 years, is how do we look at really large bodies of text that where we don't understand the language, we don't understand the meaning, uh, and, and we sort of want to start making headway on, 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 on such a question. So there are some peculiarities to the situation. So one thing is that there's, um, the books uh, are kept through the ages by being copied by scholars, and the scholars act in lineages where they very rarely cross between the lineages. So there's whole lineages of scholars that, that are related to each other, that copy the books, and they don't really cross-talk between the lineage, just as within the lineage. Um, so the books tend to be sort of, rep we think the books tend to be representative of the lineage that they're, they're coming from. Um, and because scholars are copying these books actively, each book's going to typically have many very similar copies within a library, but maybe not identical copies. So um, we don't necessarily know that for sure, but, but that's what we sort of see with some of our, our dipping into things. Um, and then for the purposes of today's talk, let's just say that we, we don't actually understand this language at all. There, there's some things that we do understand, there's some things that we don't understand. But let's just say for today, we're going to do some pure sort of literature phenomenology. Um, 
And uh, there are also some technical peculiarities to this. So, so one thing is that it's actually really straightforward to digitize a library by feeding it into a paper shredder. It's the only way you have access to the contents of the library. Um, uh, and uh, if this sounds destructive, I would actually point out that Werner Vinge has proposed this as a way to digitize libraries, to feed them into a paper shredder and then photograph all of the shreds of paper as they go by and computationally reassemble them, which is kind of the, what I'm going to be talking about today. So this is a semi-serious proposal for, for dealing with vast topics of dispo vast quantities of disposable books. Um, uh, so while it's easy to digitize a library, it turns out to be considerably more work to go in and pick out a particular book and just, just digitize that book. So we can get libraries, but we can't get books out of them um, experimentally. Um, and in practice, we don't actually have the pictures of the shreds. What we do is we digitize the text on the shreds. So uh, we have a relatively small error rate of maybe one error in 100 to 1,000 ca characters that are digitized. So by and large, it's pretty accurate. But you do have, if you generate enough pieces of digital information, there's going to be a pretty high error rate in, in all of this. Okay. So, um, so what kind of questions do I want to ask of this? Uh, so this is what I'm going to call library phenomenology. And I just want to ask questions like, how many different books are there in total across all the libraries? What books are in each library? So if I have a bunch of libraries and I, I have a bunch of books, I want to know which libraries have which books. Uh, which libraries have more unknown books? I may have some reference collection of books that I've understood or at least generated uh, copies for. Uh, but I don't you know, have all of them, so I'm looking for libraries that maybe have more unknown books than others so that I can sort of prioritize my efforts there. Um, which books appear in multiple libraries? Maybe I can learn something about the literature in this, in this weird world by figuring out, uh, you know, physical groupings of libraries tend to have this kind of book or that kind of book. Which libraries specialize in what kind of books? And then how well can we reconstruct books? Like, ultimately, what I'm actually interested in is the content of body within, the content of, of each book, not necessarily just the contents of libraries. So how do I, how, how, how well can I do that? Um, so, so first, let me say, this is a big data problem. And I know big data is like a super, I mean, it used to be a buzzword out on the West Coast. We're too hip for it now. Now it's other things, probably Internet of Things, although that's now old, so it's probably something cool, cooler. But, but I just would like to define big data as any size of data for which your tools are inadequate to the purpose, right? So if you have a super big spreadsheet and you're using Excel to analyze that spreadsheet, that may be big data because Excel can't handle certain things very well, right? On the other hand, if you're working in astronomy and you have a mere petabyte of data, well, it turns out there's some pretty good tools for interacting with, with large bodies of astronomical images, so that may not qualify as big data anymore. Here I'm going to tell you that we don't have super awesome tools for dealing with this kind of data. Um, the scale that we're talking about here is dozens to hundreds of libraries for a, a, a geographical region. Um, that's the number of samples that you could expect to get. Thousands to millions of books per library. That's the complexity of each library. Millions of words per book. So that's roughly the size of, of, of each book. And then right now we have about 200,000 known books. So this is a reference set that we can, we can sort of use to interrogate these libraries and so on. And we don't know how representative the reference set is of any particular set of libraries. We just know that these are books that, that very serious people have assured us are, are, are reasonably correct and whole. Um, and then I think... You know, so, so I worked with, a, I've been collaborating with somebody here at UW, a guy named uh, Dominic Moritz. He's in Jeff Heer's lab. And uh, um, I brought this problem to him to talk about some, building some tools. And he said, I worked at Google last summer. This isn't big data. What we will do is just buy a really big computer, put all the data on it, index it in the five most obvious ways, and then you can ask any of these questions that you want. And, and I said two things to him. One is that scientists are broke. Um, and the other thing I said is that you know, the growth of data is actually considerably faster than Moore's Law. We can shred libraries, shred and digitize libraries, much faster than we can uh, afford to buy computers. So it behooves us to put a little bit of um, mental thought into how to do this efficiently. If we, can get, if we can figure out a way to do this that, say, oh, hypothetically scales things by a factor of 1,000 to a million, well, then that would be much better than spending a million dollars buying a computer every time we get a new data set. Um, uh, I'm not sure Dominic bought it, but, you know. Uh, and I should say that, that my lab has really spent much of the last decade thinking of better ways to crunch this data. And uh, I told a story to, to Sarah earlier. Um, we're really interested in future proofing. We know that in five years there will be even more data from even more instruments, from even more libraries. And if we don't start planning now, we're not going to have the tools to deal with it then. And then when we need the tools, we're going to spend another three to five years developing the tools, at which point there will be even more data. So I'm trying to at least get on the curve, if not ahead of the curve. 
Uh, this has been something I've been doing for the last decade. I haven't been super successful, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, OK, so the other, the other point is this is big data, but, but it's not really hard big data in some sense. The difficult part is really only the scale. All of the questions that I want to ask are, are, are pretty straightforward. If I could hold all of this data in memory, if I could just do very simple, straightforward things with Python or R, I could answer all of these questions, right? If, if, if I have a bunch of text and I just want to say, how much of this text overlaps with this text, that's a really straightforward programming question to ask. The problem comes in when you have like gigabytes to petabytes, gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes of this data, because you can't all hold it in memory. Disk is really slow, like somewhere between 1,000 and a million fold slower. Cat, it's inefficient to look up large volumes of data in memory, and you get cache inefficiencies. There's a lot of practical problems. And I should say there are hundreds to thousands of people that want to ask these same questions of their own libraries, their own, their own books, and their own, and the privacy and comfort of their own lab. So it's sort of important that we don't engineer a solution that depends on a particularly expensive piece of hardware of which there's one kind in the world that needs to really be sort of um, democratized. Um, the other thing that, that has really played a huge part in my, my career is that I really like doing exploratory data analysis. And I'm not talking about what statisticians say when they say exploratory data analysis, which as far as I can tell is actually formalized to the point where like, you have some kind of model and you apply the model and it's an exploratory model. I'm really talking about like I have no idea what's in this data. It's sitting on my hard drive. I have a Python interpreter. What do I do now? Um, what I really like to do with exploratory data analysis is try something, realize I was stupid, try something again, realize I still don't know what's going on, try a third thing, and then iterate my way towards some sort of basic understanding of the structure and content of, of, of the data set. Um, this involves rapid turnaround, exploration of new ideas, and, and really rapid implementations of, of different approaches. Um, and so what my lab has sort of focused on with this stuff is building efficient approaches to doing estimations of these, of these various quantities, and then building a, a sort of hackable um, software package that implements that approach and gives us a whole library API that does like the data sanitizing and all the other stuff that so that I'm not making obvious mistakes again and again and again. I get to make exciting new mistakes again and again. So, um, so the trick, and this is really, this is the interesting computational trick. And, and I live in fear that I will be presenting this to a computer science audience and they'll be like, oh yeah, we knew that in the 50s, which was probably true. But uh, because it's a simple trick, and it's just a trick that I learned in the last year and a half. So it's still super cool to me, so don't burst my bubble, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so imagine that we can, we can, we can subsample, the, we can define a systematic way to subsample the data randomly. That, those are sort of weird words to use in common. And uniformly from any collection of words. If we can d find a way to subsample systematically from many of these different libraries and, and um, books, then we can compare those subsamples rather than comparing the whole data set. And at least for some large class of problems, we can get estimates of the, of the numbers that we're interested in. So in particular, this requires that when we subsample from this data set and we subsample from this library, that we're subsampling in such a way that the sam subsamples are comparable. And that's where the trick comes in. And, and it uses um, these things called hash functions, which turn out to be like, I already knew they were important in computer science, but they basically become my life for the last 10 years. And so, um, so I actually have, for your delectation, three different ways of, of describing this trick to you. One is with this handcrafted artisanal um, uh, image. Um, and the idea here is that you, take, you make a list of all the possible words. So suppose you just define a word size 31, 20, whatever. Uh, and you list out A, 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 ending with a B, A, 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 ending with a C. And you, just, you can do this for any finite alphabet. You can do this, right? You can just list out all possible words of given length. And you list them all out. You, let's call that S. And then you shuffle it. And the way you shuffle it is you apply a hash function. So you apply a function that essentially randomizes um, everything and turns it into a number. And then you reorder this based on this shuffling. It doesn't matter how you do this. Just imagine you're shuffling a deck of cards. The trick is you're doing it to all possible words, and you now get a randomly permuted list of all possible words. And you do this once. Then you choose a special subset. In this case, I'm just going to choose, um, uh, it doesn't matter which subset you choose. It just needs to be something that you can refer back to. So let's in this case just say it's a subset, special subset S of B. This is going to be our subsample from which we take all, all of our special words. We're going to ignore all of these words whenever they show up, and we're going to choose any of these words are special in the subsample that we take. And uh, what this lets us do is 
to subsample, we take this, this collection of the special subset down here and we intersect any specific sample we have with all of the words in the subset. And that intersection is our subsample of any library or any, any book. So a little more formally, and, and I should say, um, I, I, I don't want to do too many digressions, but uh, um, I, uh, I ended up writing this in a Jupyter notebook that let me use the LaTeX math mode without actually having to run LaTeX, which I thought was kind of cute. Anyway, so, so take all possible words in the alphabet in ordered set S, shuffle S into SR deterministically with some specific hash function, choose a scaling factor B, and this is gonna be the subsampling rate. If B is 1,000, then we're gonna take one in every 1,000 kamers, or every 1,000 words. If B is 10,000, we're gonna take one in every 10,000. If B is one, we're gonna take every, every word. Select a band of that hash space that's uh, B over the size of your word set in size, and then to subsample, intersect any sample with S of B. And I should say, for those of you that are aware of the min hash approach, steps one and two are what you do in min hash, but the rest is, is, is different. Okay, I have another, this is handcrafted artisanal Python code. Oh, please, yeah. Right. It might be extremely sparse. And so it would, your problem would be like, if I just put this thing at random, how likely is it yeah. to intersect with these other stuff? So, so we don't have that problem because we're using a hash function that's, that shuffles things randomly. So um, I should say this can be quite large as a yeah. subset, right? Uh, so it doesn't matter how sparse this is. What matters is what your subsampling rate is in relation to the amount of data you're feeding in. If you're feeding in 100 words and your subsampling rate is one in 1,000, you're in trouble. But if you're feeding in 100,000 words, then on average, um, you're gonna get uh, one one thousandth of those words in a special subset and everything's gonna work fine. I don't know if that makes sense. So you just have to have enough data, enough, enough the cardinality of the word set in your sample that your subsampling has to be right, big so enough. You're using, you're using scale theory. Yes. Um, okay, so this is my, my Python code way of explaining it. And what I like about this is how simple it is. You define a function that takes a sample, which is some set or something iterable, and you take this factor B. You calculate the boundary value in a 64-bit hash space as the total number of words divided by this boundary. And then for every word in the sample, you hash it and you check, is it less than the boundary value? If it is, keep it. So it's a single pass to subsample everything. And you only need to do this once for every input, input function. This is more or less the actual code we use. It's just typed into a computer. So, um, so this subsampling allows two estimators. Uh, and the two estimators are uh, similarity between two word collections. So we have two word collections, M and N, and to subsample them, we intersect them with S, B. And then the similarity of M and N is the Jacquard similarity, which is how many things are in common between the two over how many things are in both. And this is a standard distance measure. It's a standard way of sort of asking how similar two collections of words are. But here we're estimating it using the subsampling technique rather than calculating it directly. Um, and it's a, it's a distance metric, which means we can do all sorts of nice clustering and, and, and other things on, on this. The other thing that we can define is containment of M by N. And this is the sort of thing, suppose that N is a library and M is a book. You can ask, is this, how much of this book is in this library? By, sa by saying, I'm gonna take the subsample data sets and I'm just gonna ask how many of the k-mers at the intersection are, are in the, actually this should be M over B, sorry. Uh, how much of what's in the intersection is in M. Okay, um, if you want another picture, this is actually kind of similar to capture recapture analysis or mark and recapture analysis. Uh, the trick is what you do uh, before going out uh, into the field and doing your capture and, and recapture is you, um, you fly over the field of giraffes in a helicopter and you um, hit one in a hundred of the giraffes with a red pellet from a, from a, uh, what do you call it, a, a paintball gun. So you know, so you've marked one in 100 or one in 1,000 of the things you're capturing already, and you only count the things that you capture in, in, in this. Um, that was probably not the greatest analogy, but <laughs> we'll work with it. Um, and I should say, this was first applied to our problem by uh, this paper from Adam Philippi's group, Andav et al. in 2016, which I had the, had the pleasure to review, which was why I, I sort of stumbled across this technique. Okay, so the summary of the approach that we're gonna use is we choose one over B words to be special and then subsample the word collections down to those special words. And we can choose B. We can choose B to be equal to one. If you choose B1, you're picking all the words. You're not actually doing any subsampling. If you choose B equal to two, you're picking half the words. If you choose B equal to 10, one-tenth. 
And typically, we're choosing B to be between 1,000 and 10,000. And what this does is it takes our, our libraries and our books and shrinks them in size and on disk size and memory uh, requirements and computational requirements by a factor of, of uh, B, so 1,000 to 10,000 fold, which is pretty significant when you're talking about going from gigabytes, gigabytes, billions of words to millions of words. Um, and then we only work with these much smaller subsamples. Okay. Uh, and so the features of this approach, it's really fast and lightweight. So it allows fast and lightweight estimation of both similarity and containment. Um, B is also tunable, which means we can start with a given B and we can adjust it as, the, the, as we find we need different, different trade-offs. Uh, and the trade-off is really resolution versus time and memory. If, you, if you've picked a B to say be 1,000 and you want to do something faster, you can actually lower B, you can raise B to 10,000. You don't have to go back to the raw data. You can just pick, you can just shrink that, that special subset. And, and I have to say, it's incredibly computationally convenient. I, when I was reviewing the paper, I re-implemented the technique in the paper as part of my review. And it took me about 15 minutes in Python, and then three hours of debugging to figure out I was getting different answers from them. <laughs> um, so the key thing here is that all of the analyses that I'm going to talk about, uh, which, which, which in some look at well over a, terabase, a terabyte of, of data, can be done on my laptop, which is also pretty cool. Okay. So with this, we can do all sorts of things. We can index and search large collections of books by words. So basically, we can say uh, um, what words are in this book. And then we can, we, can, we can also reverse index by things like chapter. So we can say, what books or libraries does this chapter occur in? We can search shredded libraries by books. We can do all of these things that I wanted to do at the beginning with the questions. And the cool thing is I don't actually have to, have to do this in some incredibly efficient language that, that takes a long time to develop in. This is all done in pure, in pure Python. The only thing that we've coded in anything faster is the, uh, is the actual process of subsampling, because there you're looking at all the data in the first place. Uh, and I should say this is um, available. Everything I'm talking about is available on GitHub under this, this URL, so uh, standard open source stuff. OK, so, so let's, let's, address two, let's address two questions. So one question. When we look at all the libraries, how many of the words in the library are probably real but unknown? Uh, and a sub-question there is, can we generate books for everything in a library? Like, is there a computational approach that works for generating books? And I should say, there are computational techniques for extracting books from libraries, but um, we don't really know how well they work. So this is really, we're going to talk a little bit about evaluation here. So our exemplar data set is going to be um, uh, uh, a terabyte of data published by the Tara Ocean Survey Project, where they went around the library, and each one of these dots is a library um, where they sequenced one or more, they, they generated, um, they digitized one or more samples published in Tsunagawa et al. Um, and so we have 200 and I think it's 236 different, different libraries, um, uh, each large enough that in some there's well over a, a terabyte of data. So it's, it's annoyingly large would be my sort of, that doesn't fit on my laptop, right? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm purposely not talking at all about the science behind why they chose these locations, what they were looking for, because I really just want to ask these phenomenological questions of what's in the libraries, what's in the books. Um, and really, I want to do it anytime somebody goes out and shreds a bunch of libraries. I want them to be able to, to ask these same questions. Um, and I want to see if libraries from here are different from libraries from here. And so I want to be able to ask these, these very basic questions. Um, OK, so, so it turns out the first problem here is, if you remember, there, our digitization process has errors in it. So uh, every time we look at a fragment of text, we get a between 1 to 0.1% error rate. So 1 in 100 to 1 in 1,000 of the characters that we digitize are wrong. Um, and we also know from the technology that errors are almost entirely random, which means that because the books in a library have multiple copies, most of the real words show up multiple times in the data set, and most of the errors show up once or twice. So this gives us a way to, to filter this out. And I should note that when you look at the cardinality, how many different words there are, the vast majority of them are these errors, because every time there's an error, it generates a new word, whereas the real words you see again and again and again and again. Right? So this is a standard, standard problem. It's actually a problem that we kind of solved. Uh, um, several different people have solved in several different ways. We like ours because we wrote it, uh, but it's, we solved it a couple years ago. And, and the first thing we do is we eliminate rare words that are in common, sequen in, in common sentences as likely errors. If you see a sentence 50 times, and in one of those sentences there, there's a word that only shows up once, then probably that's, that's the result of an error. It could be something else. It could be a, a copying error that's, that's really in the library, uh, but 
that's a price we, we sort of decide to pay. The other thing we can do is we can ignore words that are only in single libraries or in less than n libraries, right? And this is a fairly straightforward statement. Like, we expect there to be kind of a common literature across all these libraries. We expect any word that's real to show up in, in sort of more than one place. If it doesn't, we can at least say, well, maybe it's an error. So the way we can increase confidence is by taking the sort of overly stringent approach that results in what I would call high confidence real words. Um, and, and so we're going to lose out on things that are real but that are rare. And that's, that's a, something, at least for this sort of statistical level analysis, we're just going to accept as, as a consequence of our approach. So, so looking at the Tara data set, how much is not in any of our reference book collection? So uh, we have about 160,000 reference books um, that contain about 650 billion words. Um, and when we select only the words that are present in 10 or more samples, that's a really stringent cutoff, right? The word has to show up at least once in 10 different libraries, so we're pretty sure it's real. There are 7.1 billion words, and 0.47 billion words are, are in our, our reference data set. So that's 6.6%. So our ability to go find books that represent what's in the libraries that, that we've sampled is, is very poor. If you relax things down and you say, uh, I want to look at all the words that are present in two or more samples. Um, basically, uh, we have about 50 billion of those, and, and 1.2 uh, billion of those are known, which gives you about 9.3%. That number seems wrong. Well, let's just pretend. I, th these numbers are probably right. I don't know where the nine, anyway. That's definitely wrong. OK. Um, what if we go forth and extract new books? What if we go and we say, we're going to, uh, we're going to run this automated process to take a library and pull out what we think are books from it. And I'll tell, talk a little bit more about that process in a second. But um, what, if we, what if we do that? Well, it turns out I didn't need to do that. Um, two other groups, uh, Telly et al. and Delmont et al. did this and, and made them available as preprints, and they made their, their books available. So I could include those. And so this was a situation where they went into all the libraries that came out of this Tara data set, and they went in and they explicitly, uh, just for this data set, tried to pull out books using available best available computational techniques. And uh, we get to the point where we can get 22% of, the, of the, what I call the cosmopolitan words, the words that are really sort of fairly ubiquitous. Um, and they get 9.3% uh, when you get down to um, when you use the, uh, uh, the, the sort of more relaxed, less stringent um, set, of, uh, set of words. So in an ideal world, our, our book extraction technology would be so good that this number would be close to 100%, right? We're literally going into a data set and trying to pull out things directly from that data set, and we're finding that we're getting less than 20% less than, than, uh, or less than 25% of the things that are in the data set recovered in books. So it tells you that our book extraction process is maybe not so, uh, I think the word would be sensitive in this case. Okay. So, okay, so some summary of this section and some thoughts. So. Uh, there's a lot of words. We're not recovering too many of them. Um, one point is that the vast majority is unknown, right? The vast majority of these words are, are not present in any of our reference book, book collections. Uh, even if we build a reference set that we extract directly from this, this, this data set. This is not a surprise to anybody that works in this field, but it is a little surprising that even when we go in specifically and pull them out that we get, we get such, such low numbers. Um, I should also say, uh, I'm never sure, um, I'm, I'm really very mild-mannered and, um, there's a word, and uh, modest. So I hate to, to sort of toot my own horn here, but literally, like, you can't, you can't do, you can't do this previous, these kinds of analyses with current software without a hell, heck of a lot of effort. So whereas this is something that I did, I reran all of this this morning in the hotel room to, so that I could make sure to get the numbers wrong. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, so this is like casual, and this is something that we can do for every library that's, that's produced. We can now just do this from, from soup to nuts. It takes less than a day to go from a, a multi-gigabyte data set to, to these numbers. Um, and you only need to do the subsampling, and that's because of the subsampling, which you have to do once. Uh, and then these files are actually small enough, these subsampled files are small enough that you can post them publicly for other people that want to investigate your libraries, which is another, a whole other open science strategy that I'm hoping to promulgate. So the other observation is that our book extraction is biased towards common words. So uh, if you take the really cosmopolitan words that are present in 10 or more samples, you get 22% of them in the extraction process. Whereas if you're looking at the rarer words that are in two or more samples, 
uh, much less gets extracted, um, much less matches as a percentage gets extracted. This again is not a big surprise if you, uh, I think, um, given how the book extraction process works, but it's, it's interesting to note. Uh, it's not necessarily what you would, you can, you can spin a story either way, and, and in this case we know that the, that, that the cosmopolitan things, the things that are present in multiple libraries get pulled out. Okay, so, so the other thing that we, another thing that we can do is with these words we can do uh, what's called rarefaction. So we can go into the data set and we can ask, suppose we do sampling and resampling and we say, um, uh, what, uh, as we increase the number of words that we sample, how many new words do we get as we, as we increase our sampling rate? And, and people that work in this field have probably seen this from uh, um, a particular kind of sentence that's in a lot of these libraries, that's in a lot of books. This is actually on the raw data, so this is on the, 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 the words themselves. So this will include many things that, that have not been included in previous analyses. And all I will say is that um, if the curve's saturated, you could conclude that we could probably stop, stop digitizing these libraries and move on with our lives and do other libraries. But as you see in every one of these situations already, this is not a big surprise, you get this curve that says, well, we, we still have a lot more to, to sample. Um, so, uh, but you can start to say things about maybe the relative complexity of libraries from, say, the Mediterranean versus libraries from the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, and that may, be, that may have interesting implications. Okay. Um, so the question that we asked was, when we look at all libraries, how many of the words are real but unknown? And the answer is 93% aren't in our reference set. Um, and when we generate books for everything in a library, we can get 10 to 20% from current extraction techniques. Uh, and even in, were we able to get like 90%, there'd still be more stuff in the libraries that we, that we weren't digitizing, that we weren't sampling with, with our, with our uh, library shredding technique. So um, here's my example of how book extraction works. Um, essentially, the computational method for going into a library and extracting a book is to try and build longer sentences from the fragments. And so what you do is you, you take fragments and you look at word overlaps between them and you say anything where there's a word overlap, like uh, there's a fragment that contains Wiesbaden and D, and then there's a fragment that contains Baden and Dostoevsky, and you can combine that into a single fragment. Um, uh, and that works quite well as long as there's no intersections between different sentences. But here we have the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, and Wiesbaden and Dostoevsky jumped at the chance, which is incidentally a real sentence that I Googled. Um, uh, and the, the book extraction process would be unable to associate Wiesbaden and Dostoevsky with uh, at the chance uh, and differentiate from this connecting to the purple, right? Inconveniently, the fragments are not colored by their source book. It's basically what I'm saying here. So, um, so, so the way that this is done is using basically a word graph. You, you take all the fragments and you, and you build connections between them, where they're, and then where there are unambiguous connections, you collapse them down into a sentence. Um, and the reason that we suspect that there are problems with this is that for complex libraries, we know that word graphs can be problematic. It's sort of okay when you have sentences where there's just two sentences and there's sort of this common word in the middle. But of course, as soon as you start sampling d libraries that are complex, you're going to end up with words like Brown and Chance and Dostoevsky that appear in multiple contexts. And the word graph is going to become very complicated and tangled. And in the end, there's actually two reports, one from our lab and one from the, um, uh, Alex Serba, that say that basically when you have many closely related books or many books that share content in a library, we can't extract books from the, the, the shredded library very well. So again, it's not a surprise, but we haven't been able to put a quantification on how much is missing prior to being able to look at these sort of billions of, of words um, and see what's missing from the books that we extract. So, so that leads to my second question, which is when we apply an algorithm to extract books from across multiple libraries, do we get good books? And, and I just want to calibrate some expectations here. Um, I do not know what these results mean. Um, I am completely at a loss. I have some ideas, and they're going to guide some future research. But I, 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 this is totally unexpected, so just to whet your appetite. It's only like four slides away. So, uh, and the sub-question is, can we develop a better algorithm to extract books from multiple libraries based on the subsampling technique? Because that would be super cool if we were like, hey, we got all these libraries, and we went out and we did some clever statistical technique, and now we can tell you which parts of the library belong to which book. Like, that would be a whole new way to do things, and this is what I was actually setting out to do with this whole project in the beginning. And, and um, at least for now, the answer seems to be no, but uh, I live in hope. 
So, so our, our book extraction algorithm generates what I would call hypothetical books. They're books where the fragments hang together. And, and, and there's other techniques that can sort of um, evaluate how well that works, but, but it turns out to be quite hard to, to do uh, because you sort of have to have only your shredded library to look at in terms of validating the contents of the books. Um, so you either have to go to orthogonal data sets, which are expensive and slow, or you have to do something clever statistically, which um, we, we haven't necessarily done yet. Um, so, so my naive expectation is that I would naively expect that books would contain words and sentences that hung out together, right? If you have multiple copies of a book in a library and there's a sentence that's in, there are two sentences of that book, well, if that book's present in multiple libraries, those sentences should co-occur in those, those libraries, right? Does that make sense as a sort of expectation? There's a common book and that same edition is present in like 15 libraries. Well, I should see the sentences in that book co-occur in those, in those 15 libraries. There's some assumptions that go into that, but that was sort of my naive, my naive assumption. And so can we formalize this? And the answer is yes, via a, a word association metric. And so, so here I should say, one of the sort of fun things about my job is spending six months throwing all of the techniques we can think of at these data sets and then realizing that none of them work and then madly Google searching for like a week trying to figure out what other keywords you're missing for, because surely somebody has done this before and then at the very end of this like three to six month period discovering that there is in fact a vast literature in uh, linguistics um, involved with word association metrics. And all you have to do is Google for word association metrics and you'll recover that literature and libraries that implement it and mathematical theorems that prove things about it and then your life will be much easier three to six months after you started working on the project. So this is sort of the nature of this, this interdisciplinary world where techniques that you've never heard of may actually solve your problem because you just, I, I don't know much of anything as it turns out, but I just don't, I don't read linguistics journals. Okay. So what we're gonna be talking about here is something called pointwise mutual information. And the formal definition is this. You, you take, uh, what you're looking for is, is how well two words correlate across multiple samples. And so this, um, if you have n samples and you have, each sample contains word x and word y, and you sort of can count how many samples contain those words, and you count the number of samples that contain both x and y, you get these observed frequencies, uh, the fraction of samples that have x and y together, and the fraction of samples that have just word x, then the estimate of their mutual information, their pointwise mutual information, can be uh, defined as, as the log of the frequency that they occur together over the frequency that they occur independently. If they're completely randomly associated, then this, this number turns out to be zero. If they're, uh, if they're perfectly correlated, this number is high. If they're perfectly anti-correlated, this number is low. Uh, and in the case where we define things here, you can say uh, the pointwise mutual information is the number of samples times the number of, of samples where x and y, the two words x and y co-occur, divided by the number of samples with x and the number of samples with y. Um, there's a couple more definitions, I apologize, but basically you can normalize this by dividing by the log of fxy, which gives you this normalized PMI, which goes between minus one and one. If it's one, they're perfectly correlated. If it's minus one, they're perfectly anti-correlated. If it's zero, they're essentially uh, um, randomly associated. And then we actually uh, applied something that we just called weighted PMI, which was we wanted to look for cosmopolitan words that co-associated, because our intuition was um, that, uh, well, what we were interested in was things that occurred in many samples that also co-occurred in in, across those many samples. Um, so the numbers I'm gonna show you are weighted PMI, but it turns out uh, it doesn't matter which of these numbers you use, none of it works. Okay, uh, just to give away the ending. So an example of PMI in English is here. So for example, Puerto Rico. Uh, so this is for the first 50 million articles in Wikipedia. Uh, this is just from the Wikipedia page on pointwise mutual information. Puerto Rico basically Puerto and Rico basically co-occur all the time. Of and and may co-occur a fair bit, but they occur so frequently that in general they're not associated particularly, right? So, so this is what we're gonna do, but we're gonna do this with words in our unknown literature. Seems like a super awesome technique that should return really interesting results. Um, so what do these things look like? Well, so we, we built, the other fun thing that we do in, in, in my lab is um, develop a new data analysis technique and then desperately try to figure out how to plot it. Um, and so uh, we developed this, this very, we developed these quilt plots and I'm gonna try to explain them. 
I apologize in advance. These are the four figures that I need to figure out how to actually represent properly. So this is a matrix of the chosen words in, in, a, in a genome. So this is a, this is a particular book that we've extracted from the, 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 that somebody else has extracted. And then each of these dots is the, the uh, weighted pointwise mutual information between those words across all of the samples that we have. So uh, uh, generally along the diagonal, there's gonna be strong correlations, except that, um, so here for example, uh, this word is present in all three samples. Um, but doesn't actually, uh, this block of words is present in all three samples, but doesn't, doesn't, um, but aren't correlated with other words across all three samples. They're correlated with others across two uh, and some others across, across one. Um, and then on the side here, I've plotted which of the six samples, each of the three clusters here, so the biggest cluster, the medium cluster, and the small cluster uh, are present in. So you can see that the biggest cluster, which has, um, I get the sorting wrong? Well, the biggest cluster is present in three samples, so it has a weighted PMI of three because it's perfectly correlated and they're in all three samples. The um, small cluster here is present in, no, okay, I got it wrong. This, this is present in uh, two samples. This little one is present in one sample, and this really small one is present in three samples, which is why it's the darkest. So this is just a way of looking at sort of the co-occurrence of words chosen by their presence in a book. Uh, and you can sort of see, I don't actually draw the lines every time, but you can see basically I'm, I'm running this, this association metric and then clustering the matrices and printing out where the, where the, the different clusters co-occur. So it turns out that some of these uh, books have really high internal associations. So here we have out of uh, um, you know, about 100, uh, 100 words that are in this, this book uh, subsampled, so it's actually 100 times 10,000, so it's about um, whatever that is, uh, and we can see that, that a lot of them co-occur, something like 90% of them co-occur in, in two samples, and there's a little blip there where, where they're only, this cluster here of words is only present in one sample. So this is like library phenomenology at its most basic. I have a book, where does it co-occur, and, and do I see association of the words in that book across samples? This looks pretty good. Uh, others have a mixture of association, so here there's sort of many of the words in the book co-occur in samples. Some don't really co-occur at all. They co-occur in one, in one sample. And then there's a, there's a small subset that are present across all three samples. Um, so this utterly violates my idea that this book should be present. But you could sort of spin a tale like, well, this part of the, this part of the book is reasonably important, this part of the book is really important, and this part's dispensable, so when the scholars were copying it, they, they sort of randomly picked and chose, and, and this is what we got. There's, many of them are just strange. And what I mean by that is that you get these patterns where there are things, I mean, this is really the most informative thing to look at over here. You get a bunch of different clusters of words. Some of them are present in only in, in um, one sample. Some of them are present in three different samples. And there's a lot of sort of orthogonality to what's present where. That is, there's some words that are present in sample one, and there's other words that aren't in sample one but are in sample two. You know, uh, I should say that one column always has to be 100% because of the way we extract books. It's, it's enforced. And um, all I can say from this is that, all I can say, <laughs> Sarah did warn me. Um, all, all I can say from this is that uh, um, I know of no straightforward observation in this field that would explain this kind of co-occurrence pattern. And we see a lot of these. So, so I'm just gonna say like, our, the summary of our extracted book evaluation, I have hundreds of these plots. I spared you 99.9% .9 of them. I'm trying to figure out how to rank them and, and evaluate them for quality. But basically, there turns out to be no strong correlation between sentences and chapters in extracted books across the samples. It seems to be pretty much random. Uh, the only correlation is artifactual. Um, rare books have strong internal PMI because they only occur in one or two libraries in the first place. So it's, it's as soon as they occur in multiple libraries, there's, there's no cor strong correlation between most of the words. And I should say I've done some efforts, I've basically done some Monte Carlo simulations. That's a fancy way of saying I randomly subsampled from, from the space of, of, of words. There appears to be no difference from background from, in clustering from what you get just by subsampling randomly from the libraries. And uh, this is really puzzling. So my number one explanation is broken code. 
like everything I did is wrong. That's always a good default in data science. Um, uh, I, I, I could be. Um, I put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that's not the case and re-examining it. It might be that our library sampling is too coarse. It might be that, that if, you, if you sample from libraries that aren't immediately adjacent to each other, there's sort of a decay where books, as they travel between libraries, lose content. Um, it's still strange that there's not like core portions of books that are really important that stay in the books. Uh, it's pretty clear, if this all holds, it's pretty cl clear my naive assumptions about, about how books should hang together across libraries are just wrong. And, and it would be cool if this turned into